And let me just say again, it's really, it's a privilege to get to open the word of God with you. I'm looking forward to our time. And, uh, and it really is sweet to see some of your names out there and then some of your faces out there and know that you're in pre-organized conversations and prayers more often than you, than you would think. Um, now, in addition to that, uh, on Sunday morning, Lord willing, you'll see Priyanka and Haven, but as it is um, 1030, my little girl has gone to bed and her mother is appropriately upstairs, um, close enough to hear her cries. So that being said, um, it's just me tonight. Uh, let's turn to Daniel chapter six, which is an incredibly familiar portion of scripture, but we're actually going to skip kind of the entire familiar portion of that passage. And uh, we're going to look at a bit of a, another angle, an angle that's really encouraged me in the past couple weeks during uh, this season of quarantine. And I hope they'll do the same for you. It's very practical, but at the same time, I do believe it'll be quite a challenge to our hearts. Now, let's just start out by thinking in a certain way here. Imagine if right now with COVID-19 and just the scenario, the, the situations in our world, Imagine if you could have just a, a list handed to you, okay? And on this list are possible outcomes of the situation. So you can picture the outcomes. You basically have like, let's say three, four, five outcomes and you read all the outcomes and you say, okay, well, that's the outcome I want. And I'm talking the end result. I'm not talking 2020 December. I'm talking like 2025, all right? All right, well, you probably would choose an outcome that that sounds pretty legit and where things come back together and where, um, where basically problems are solved. So what I wanna do is I wanna start at the end of this message. So basically, if you're taking notes, the first point I'm gonna give you is gonna be point number six. Then we'll go back to points one through five. But I wanna start with the end. So I wanna start with what is going to be Daniel's culmination or the culmination of this passage and you could put down the final product. So I want to start at the end of Daniel chapter six, and then we'll go back to the beginning and we'll look at the rest of the points, um, which will be in basically two verses. So in Daniel chapter six, let's read the very end, which are verses 25 through 28. And I think, I'm pretty sure all of you are going to like the ending. You're all going to say, that's the ending I choose. I would agree with you. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. So this is a worldwide proclamation. Peace be multiplied to you. Now that's a good thing when it's coming from a ruler that has a lot of power. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So there you have it. Great ending, right? Imagine the most powerful leader in the world says everybody needs to worship the God of the scriptures. I like it. I like it a lot. Plus, there's peace for everyone. But the thing about it is we oftentimes like the final product, but we don't like the process, the process that gets us to it. And so what I really want us to look at are the elements of the process in Daniel's um, life, just based off of really two verses. Again, this chapter is known in Sunday school and VBS and whatnot for Daniel in the lion's den. We're not going to interact with any lions here, all right? Um, we have enough cats going around with Tiger King and whatnot. So we're skipping all the cats. We're just going to the portion before that. And so I want you to go back earlier in the chapter. And verses 1 through 9, I'm just going to sum up for you. Basically, Daniel doesn't have flaws that can be addressed. But people are out to get him. The satraps are out to get him. Why? There's this Daniel who's a leader in the Persian world, even though he's actually from Israel. Now, with that being said... They want to get him out of this high position because they don't like him. And why don't they like him? He has favor in the eyes of the king, and he's got favor in the eyes of God. So they try to come up with a decree that will get him in trouble. But the only way they can get him in trouble is with his God. So you probably know this story well. Verse 5, we won't find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So what do they do? They make a law. 
And they make this law and it gets passed by the king. And the law is this in verse seven, that whoever makes petition to any God or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. All right. So Daniel, he's up there in government. He knows what's going on. He knows that he's going to get in trouble if he prays uh, to God of heaven. So now, therefore, let's pick up in verse 10. And all we're going to focus in on are verses 10 and 11. So just like hang out here, meditate on this, marinate in it, and I think we'll get some really uh, sweet things from the Lord. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. All right, so there you go. We start with number six, the final product, but now we're going to backtrack, backtrack, and I want you to see a few different things that are going on here. All right, so the first thing uh, just to really notice in Daniel's life is Daniel's contemplation, or you could say his formed pattern, his formed pattern. See, Daniel had a formed pattern of life, and this formed pattern of life is really, it comes out in verse 10 when it says, as he had done previously. Now, this is very valuable for me personally, just to think through, because I have to admit that when I think about tomorrow, um, I oftentimes will have a formed pattern of things I do, but they're not necessarily very um, God-centered things. I'm not saying they're anti-God, but like I plan to eat a few times tomorrow. I plan to take my thyroid medicine first thing in the morning, um, an hour before I have my cup of coffee. Um, I plan to, you, go, you, go, you get the idea. I plan to do many things. But what I love about Daniel is he had a formed pattern of his life that revolved around his communion with God. And so I'm not going to focus on this much, but I just want to ask the question. When you think about your plans for tomorrow, do you have this formed pattern around communion with your God? And, and, and it's not going to just be, we're going to see this a, a little bit later, but it's not just a, a morning time with him. It's really a way that we're constantly hanging out before his throne. So just kind of keep that in mind. I'm not focusing there, but let's move on. Now, this part really... Um, is also kind of an introductory point because point number three is really where we're going to dig in deep. But the next thing is after his contemplation, Daniel had a commitment, a commitment. So he had this pattern. And what is the first, the first thing was form pattern. The next thing is he had a firm priority. Now his firm priority was this, that Daniel would not at any point compromise to put the things of earth before the things of God. This is his firm priority. Why do we see that? Well, we see it in verses 10 and 11, where it says um, he got down on his knees and it says he gave thanks before his God. And then again, in verse 11, it says he makes pleas before his God. There had just been a decree put out, right, where he was only to go before Darius, before the king. But what you see here is he has a firm priority. And that firm priority is that he has obedience to man before, I mean, obedience to God, before obedience to man. In other words, what man is doing doesn't change his first priority in life, and that is that he is going to obey God regardless. Now, I mentioned those two things, even though they're out of order in the passage, because I want you to see that those two things are always going to be dictating what Daniel is going to do. You see, he's got this formed pattern, his pattern of life, and then he's also got a firm priority that, okay, this is the way I'm going to live, and this is my priority. This is going to come first. I remember back in Senegal growing up, we had uh, this lady that was very close to our family, a Senegalese woman named Yassin, and, uh, and, and she came to know Christ from an Islamic background, and there was a lot of persecution in her life, specifically from her Muslim husband, who, um, who, who abused her quite a bit because of her faith, and there was always this threat that if you get baptized, you're going to be kicked out of the home, I'm going to divorce you, and I'm taking the children. So she was going to lose her children. And obviously, I think, uh, I should say obviously, I've never been a mother, and I'll never be a mother. But that being said, uh, from a father's heart, I, I really can't think of anything more tragic than having my children taken from me. And one day she was um, listening to these cassette tapes um, back in the 90s, these cassette tapes of 
um, Wolof songs, just songs, um, just, just songs we sing in church. And there's this one song that says, Degel Yala Mogun Degel Nit, which basically just means to listen to God is better than listening to man. And just was playing over and over and just hit her that day. And she's realized, hang on, there really is no debate here. This is not a subject to be debated. I have to obey God and then I have to trust him with the results. And the beautiful thing about that is it was a testimony before her children. And even today, um, though they're not necessarily walking close to the Lord, some of her kids are very sensitive to things of God. And she did not lose the children, but she chose to be baptized and follow the Lord. Now, all I'm saying is, as we think through what's going to come in days to come, let's make sure we have these two things in order. We have our pattern and we have our priority because those are going to dictate the way ultimately we live life. So now let's look at Daniel. How did he practically handle this? And there are three, three more points that we'll quickly touch on. And, and I'll make sure that you all get out of here at eight o'clock and for me, 11 o'clock. All right. So here we go. The three things that just come out clearly in this passage now in his actual actions are this. Daniel has a fight plan. So he has a formed pattern, a firm priority, and now he has a fight plan. What is Daniel's fight plan? I love this. Verse 10, when Daniel knew, See, you could fill in the blank with whatever you want. He knew what Darius uh, had decreed. He knew the law of the Medes and the Persians. He knew the satraps were out to get him. I mean, he knew all these things. So when Daniel knew. And see, I put myself in that situation and I put a blank slot there. When Nathan knew that this was the situation, then I have to say, what, did, what do I do? See, so often, it's not that I'm going to go against the laws of God, but I'm not going to go to God. See, so often my first resort is not my knees. My first resort is not prayer. It's not that I don't pray. It's that that, that is not my fight plan. So often that, that and I, I can say it is, and I can say, well, I pray about it. But do I, do I just pray about it as a formality or do I pray about it as actually my weapon against the enemy of, well, of, our, of, of the spiritual world per se? And this is what I love about the way that he chose to fight this. So let me ask a question. Do I combat the things of earth with a cry to heaven? In other words, do I fight the battles of this world with an eternal perspective? This was Daniel's conviction. His conviction is when he knew the document had been signed, well, what did he do? He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. And so I just pray that we too would have this heartbeat, this desire to say, hey, my way of fighting, and here's the cool thing, you'll never get this method of fighting gone because wherever you are in whatever situation you're in, you have the opportunity and invitation to this fight plan. And this fight plan is a life of prayer. Do we believe it's actually powerful? So he gets down on his knees. But, but my, my favorite part is really this next thing, this fourth thing, this fourth point. And this is the one that actually inspired everything in this message. And this is really where we're going to take probably a solid seven to 10 minutes and really focus on it. It's kind of funny because what I'm speaking on on Sunday is going to be themed with this passage. So it's not going to be in Daniel. But then I was thinking back to Yosemite and I thought, you know what? This is actually a perfect continuation from our last message of Yosemite. Not that I expect any of you to remember right offhand what the last message of Yosemite was. But we talked about an open window in 2 Kings chapter 13. And what we're going to talk about here is an open window. And then on Sunday, we're going to talk about an open window of sorts as well. So this open window, the fourth thing is this, after the fight plan, I want you to see that in that fight plan, Daniel had a fixed perspective, a fixed perspective. Now think about this. It says he opened his window toward Jerusalem. I believe that this right here is really going to be our takeaway for tonight. A fixed perspective. It says he opened his window. Now, if I open the windows in my office where I'm sitting right now, I don't have a choice of which direction I open them. If I open them from South Carolina, they're going to be facing in the direction north. They're going to be facing towards Washington, D.C., towards New York City, towards New Brunswick, I guess, towards, you know, whatever, the pole. Um, which I guess all of us eventually will, uh, if it's north or south, right, we're heading towards the pole. But the point being is, I don't get to pick where I'm opening my windows. I open my windows in the direction that they were put in my wall. But most homes back in that day, if it's the upper chamber, and even in, in, in countries where I live, like in Senegal or Niger, if an upper chamber is built on the roof of a house, it, it'll usually have four pillars, 
and then kind of curtain-like structures or some, some sort of barrier, tarp, whatever it is. So the point being is you usually can choose which direction you open your window. And now if there are dust storms, you're gonna keep that side blocked off and you might get air in from the opposite side. But notice that Daniel had a practice. He chose to open his window toward Jerusalem. So this fixed perspective was not a random thing. This was an intentional act. So I have to ask us a question and then we'll break down the question. In what direction do you open the windows of your life? Now, this is going to become very clear here in a minute. Why was Jerusalem so important for him opening his windows in this direction? Well, in both the books of the Kings and also in the Chronicles, but specifically in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And I'll just read a couple of verses from there. But again, you'll find some parallel passages. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, you're going to see why he opens his doors in this direction. It actually says specifically, it says, if they sin against you, and this is as Solomon's blessing the temple, okay? So we're talking about the temple of God, um, the, the place where God chose to dwell. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near. Yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their heart, with all their soul in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive, listen, and pray toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city, that's Jerusalem, that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their pleas and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now again, this is repeated, but notice He's saying, when you sin, this is like a verse we quote so often, right? When we get, uh, if my people who are called by my name, right? We, we, I've been hearing that a lot recently, and I understand the context. My point being here is, understand that's a similar context. If they have sinned, what do they do? In repentance, they are to pray. But part of that repentance is what? They are to look toward their land. They are to look toward their home. They are to look toward that dwelling place of God. And so I started thinking, well, Lord, what does that look like for me? Well, clearly, prayer and repentance is a similar action. But what does that look, for, look, look like for us? I mean, in 2020, whether you're in California or whether you're all the way across the nation in South Carolina, it's the same. We've got to open the windows of our life right now toward the promises of God. We've got to open the windows of our life toward what has God said. What has God said will last? Well, souls and the word of God are going to last. What is the promise of God? The promises of God is I will come again. That it works to encourage each other with those words. I appreciated that one or two of the brothers, even during the prayer time, specifically said, even so come Lord Jesus in some words or another. And, and when we open the windows of our life towards God's big picture, we start to see our circumstances through a completely other set of lenses. We start to realize that, hang on, there's a much bigger thing happening. And what's that bigger thing? Well, we see at the end of this chapter that all, all nations and languages and peoples are going to have peace proclaimed to them. Well, that's what God's doing as well, isn't it, in this world? He's drawing souls to himself, and he's doing it during these days. And you are his witnesses. We are his ambassadors. We are a letter being read by all men. We are the aroma of Christ. But when our windows are not open toward Jerusalem, in other words, when our windows are not open toward the promises of God, what are we going to be focused on? We're going to probably be focused on what Babylon's doing. We're going to be focused on the laws of the Medes and the Persians. We're going to be focused on the lions then that's impending. And our decisions are, are going to be altered because we don't have a fixed perspective. I like pigeons as an example here. We used to raise pigeons in Senegal. Uh, I shouldn't say, unfortunately, we raised a lot of animals, um, but sometimes that's the way I felt, especially for the sheep. But, uh, but we raised pigeons as well. And pigeons have this very unique way of walking, if you've never noticed. Um, it's very jerky. It's, they keep bringing their head up. And I didn't know why they brought their head up in such a jerky manner uh, until I looked more into why, why they, they walk with the pigeon walk. And the thing about pigeons is they, they can't focus while they're moving. 
they have to stop. So if you watch a pigeon, really you got to film them and then just kind of like, like watch it in slow motion. The pigeon's jerk is actually to refocus, to refocus, to refocus. You get the idea. He's refocusing, she's refocusing constantly. And that's what we've got to do. You see, we live in such a busy world, don't we? We're always on the move. And God's given us such a sweet gift right now. Such a sweet gift. We might not like it. We might not like the way it's come packaged, but it's a sweet gift just to stop, be still, and know that I am God. To open the window of our life toward Jerusalem again. To open the window of our life toward he is coming soon. And he brings his reward with him. Are we living in such a way where we are anticipating, in a positive way, anticipating his return? Do we cry out, even so come Lord Jesus, not to escape this, the things of this world, but because we long to see him, to enjoy him forever in perfection, absent of sin. Like there's just so much beauty to what we are invited into in prayer and to open our windows toward. And so I just want to encourage you with Daniel's consistency here that he had this fixed perspective. So let me make a statement, all right? Now, if I had been speaking to young people, and I know there are some young people out there, but if I had been speaking to young people, I probably would have prefaced this point with a question. And I would have said, so what are you looking forward to in the future? And, and, and it's not a trick question because it's fine to look forward to good things. Um, I know that last year about this time, I was looking forward to coming to Yosemite, um, very, very much so. I know that there are uh, people that I long to see and I look forward to seeing them. Um, maybe I look forward to, um, well, I don't look forward to Haven's first step anymore. She's walking everywhere, but um, you look forward to things like that, right? So it's okay to look forward to things, but we have to be careful in this world, the things that we really look forward to, because the things we look forward to will tend to be the things that we live for. And, and, I, and, I, and I say that obviously with, you know, certain amount of um, slack per se, because it doesn't mean you're living for it just because you're looking forward to something. But think about it in your career, the things you're looking forward to, the things you're trying to achieve, they tend to be the things that we invest into. It tends to be the things that we live for. And so what you look toward tends to be what you're going to live for as well. And so I'm asking the question to myself, and I invite you into the question, are you looking toward Jerusalem? Are you looking toward eternity to be with the Lord? Are you looking toward the promises of God? Are you looking toward the glory of God? All of these things. And so I love the fact that Daniel had a fixed perspective in his life, a fixed perspective. But then there's one more thing I just want to bring out very quickly, and that is that he had a familiar posture. Daniel had a familiar posture, and this familiar posture, though he had a fixed perspective and he knew the promises of God, he knew his place in all of this. First of all, the very fact that he was looking toward Jerusalem based on 2 Chronicles 6 kind of indicated that he was in repentance, right? He was repenting for the sake of his people. But his posture. What was his posture? It says he got down on his knees three times a day. He got down on his knees three times a day. Um, actually, I was uh, thinking through just the whole getting down your knees three times a day. First of all, uh, well, in this familiar posture, you see his, his consistency, but you see his confidence. And where is his confidence? It's in what God is doing. So a couple of verses here. One, um, one is in Psalm chapter 5, verse 3. Psalm 5.3, and this is just a, a little bit of a, it's not an aside, but it, it is a bit of a rabbit trail. In Psalm 5.3, um, David says, O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Um, and, and I love just this idea that he starts the day in the morning with the Lord. Um, it's been put this way, that you pray in the morning for guidance. You pray in the morning for guidance. Well, then go to um, Psalm chapter 55. Psalm 55. And just uh, one verse there. Psalm 55 and verse 7 says this. Um, and I may have the wrong verse. Psalm 55 verse 7. Does not seem to, yeah, seven, sorry, 17, that would be the issue. 17, evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. 
Now, I'm not suggesting we all need to utter our complaints and moan, okay? Now, if you need to, the Lord is the one to do it to, all right? Frankly, he cares more than anyone else cares. Um, but evening and morning at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. In the morning, when you get up, do you pray for guidance? As you go through your day, do you pray at noon for strength? As you lay down in the evening, do you thank God for rest? I just love, I love the fact that in his familiar posture, Daniel didn't move forward on his feet first. Daniel moved forward on his knees first. And, and this is really, to me, it, it becomes clear in the world of sports. But first, I'll give you an Abraham Lincoln example, and then I'll go to sports because the sports would be more personal. Um, Abe Lincoln is just uh, something that actually I really have never done. But he uh, obviously grew up as a woodsman, right? I believe it was in Kentucky. I could be wrong. Um, and he he said, basically, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first four hours sharpening my axe. If I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first four hours sharpening my axe. Well, his point was, I can do a lot more in two hours with a sharp axe than six hours with a dull axe, right? So it's a simple point. But then I started to think, I was like, well, that, that's kind of true of, of basically everything. I mean, you think about how long uh, a soldier trains, right? And how much time they actually spend in combat. Well, a lot of it's just training. I mean, yeah, sure, they're, they're in the field maybe a lot, but the actual moments of combat probably are way less than the moments of training. In sports, I coach swimming. We spent countless hours in a pool, but the actual competition, well, I mean, depends what they're, what they're swimming. If they're swimming the 50, they might only be in the water for 24 seconds. The, the point being is that we're training a lot longer oftentimes than we are actually, let's say, in the actual action itself. Well, spiritually speaking, we can't separate prayer from the action because prayer is actually the greatest um, action. It is our fight plan. But so often, what do we see? We, 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 we just want to go straight to that tree. We want to go straight to the chopping. But the reality is uh, this sharpening of the ax God calls us to lives of prayer. He, he calls his house, not a house of preaching, not a house of good works. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. The only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus how to teach them was how to pray. Um, it's just beautiful that this is really the central theme of a follower of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. It is going to be someone who goes to their knees and prays. Now, you might think, okay, with all of this put together in this message, well, I guess we can conclude that everything goes great when we follow that protocol. And you all know what happens next. He gets caught. He gets thrown into a den of lions. I mean, it doesn't go the way that we would envision obeying God would go. So here's my encouragement to you. My encouragement to you is as you shut off Zoom and go back to life, first open the window of your life toward Jerusalem. Have a fixed pattern, a firm pattern, a familiar posture. Make sure that you establish these things and say, whatever happens around me, this is my mainstay because this is what I know to be true, that what God says goes, that he desires a relationship with me where he is my plan for the day and the other things fit into that. And that he wants us to have a perspective that looks at what he says is true, not just at what we see might happen. And then I want to just close with reminding you of the final verses again. What happened at the end? Well, peace and God was greatly glorified. His name was proclaimed throughout. And that's what's going to happen through your life when you have a life looking toward Jerusalem, looking toward eternity. So I don't know if you're discouraged, but let me tell you. Be encouraged because everything that the Lord wants from you has not been taken away from you. All he's looking for is faithfulness, faithfulness in these moments of perhaps mundane living or faithfulness perhaps in days of loss or chaos or disillusionment or confusion because the reality is God's on the throne. He's not up for election. He rules, he reigns. And when we look and what he has said is true, I've got good news for you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God, it endures forever. So like a pigeon, stop, 
Focus, fix your eyes on what's never going to move. And you will walk through this time, maybe through a lion's den, but you'll walk through this time. And the last chapter will be your life will bring God great glory. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this example of Daniel. Thank you for his decision, his decision to have this formed pattern, a firm priority, a fight plan that was to pray, a fixed perspective on Jerusalem, a familiar posture on his knees, and that final product of seeing you greatly glorified through his life. I pray that each one of us would do likewise, that we would be a people who choose, <laughs> choose to look at your promises instead of focusing on the world's chaos around us. Oh God, help us, for without you we can do nothing. Bless your word to each of our hearts and may it uh, in none of our lives be taken away by the birds or um, just uh, grow up and be choked by thorns, but may it bring forth much fruit, all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.